Well, we have a nice crowd. I think we're going to, you know, try to get ourselves out of church and off the parking lot before we have the uh, 1215 coming up. But I don't know if anybody else thinks that's possible. <laughs> we'll see. All things are possible with God. This is the Feast of Christ the King. This is really essentially what we're all about because it has to do with the reign of the kingdom of God and Christ is ahead, the Lord, the King of all. King of creation, King of the universe. He is the master, we are the servants. And this is the very last Sunday of the church's liturgical year. Next Sunday, of course, begins Advent where we begin anticipating the promise of the completion of the reign of God when Christ comes again. We often think of Christmas and Advent as being preparation for, you know, preparing for the birth of the Lord, but that already happened. What it is is as we remember the promise made to Mary and, you know, the birth of Christ and the incarnation uh, at Bethlehem, you know, the whole purpose of Advent is to prepare ourselves for the coming year and for the coming fulfillment, which the reign of God under Christ, the only begotten Son, is meant to establish and convey. And it's already started, it's just not complete. And so that's why we start the year with the beginning of the promise and we end the year with a reminder that God is king. Uh, some time ago, I think it was in the 70s, it was when there were so many hijackings of the airplanes. And I actually had tried to, I had this on, in my computer somewhere. I probably have it as a piece of paper somewhere. But even with several search engines, I couldn't find it you know, in real time on the internet. I can only recall it imperfectly. So I can't tell you the date, I can't tell you the airline, I can't tell you the pilot, but it was a hijacking. And what happened is the plane was forced to land in the desert. The hijackers had wanted to call attention to, you know, what, what they were protesting. And so they used this event to draw the attention of the world. And of course, even though they wouldn't let the people get off the plane after several days the, uh, in captivity, they did allow reporters to come up. And so what happened is I was watching the TV and one reporter had come up with a truck and put, got a ladder, a step ladder, not a step ladder, but a A-frame ladder, and put it up to the window of the cockpit. Now I was astounded that I find out that the, cock, the pilot's cockpit window could open. Why would you design a plane with a window that you could open? And I guess mainly just for that, I suppose. They hit him a sandwich while they're washing the plane or something. But in this case, the, w the window was open and the reporter put the microphone up. You saw a heavily bearded pilot looking kind of ashen. And the reporter said, what's going on? And the pilot said, God still reigns. God still reigns. I can't remember the plane or the pilot, but I still remember that phrase. That whatever else was going on, Everything is still under God's control, in God's charge, according to God's plan, even when we disobey. My father is fond of saying that sometimes people will say when they reach a calamity or, you know, they, everything they possibly can do has, has borne no fruit and, you know, they have no, nothing else left and they go, well, it's in God's hands now. My father always says, whose hands was it in before? Did we just suddenly decide to give it to God, you know? The, um, and so that's the part of what it means to be king of all creation, Lord of life. And I should read you this, it'll make it go better. The, um, the kingdom of God is at the center of Jesus' teaching, and the phrase kingdom of God occurs in the Gospels 122 times, of which 90 instances are used by Jesus. Remember the Magi from the Far East came to Jerusalem and asked the question, where is the baby born to be king of the Jews? We saw his star, we've come to worship him. During the royal reception given to Jesus on Palm Sunday, the, victor the uh, enthusiastic crowd shouted, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But they thought that he would be a, <clears throat> the Messiah who would overturn the rule of the Roman occupying government and restore the Davidic kingdom. But as Jesus brought before Pilate is asked, are you a king? And Jesus says, <clears throat> it is you who say I am, you know, but the reason I was born and the reason I came into this world was for one purpose, to testify to the truth. And at that point, Pilate being, you know, a certainly, you know, very practical politician and having to have connived his way in and out of trouble said, truth, what is that? It still sounds reasonable today, doesn't it? Truth, what's that? But when he asked Jesus, are you a king? He said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, my followers would be fighting. 
And at one point he told the disciples, when they said, God forbid you should die. And he said, look, you know, if I needed it, le my father would send legions of angels to support me. But I've come into the world to make all things new. I'm coming to the world to refresh the world, to save it again. And in order to try to give, give the humankind and all of creation a fresh start after we were tossed out of the Garden of Eden. What does this do for us? And how does this exist? Well, here's this little quotation that I found on the Vatican website. It says, what is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of Christ the King? And this is from Gerald Daring at St. Louis University. He says, the kingdom of God is, is a couple things. Now, Jesus always used to say the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. He, he would give those analogies. This man says, the kingdom of God is a space. It exists in every home where parents and children love each other. It exists in every region and country that cares for its weak and vulnerable. It exists in every parish that reaches out to the needy. So the kingdom of God is a space. Then he says the kingdom of God is also a time. It happens whenever someone feeds a hungry person or shelters a homeless person or shows care to a neglected person. It happens whenever we overturn an unjust law or correct an injustice or avert a war. It happens whenever people join in the struggle to overcome poverty, to erase ignorance, to pass on the faith. So the kingdom of God is a time. The kingdom of God is, since it's time, it's also in the past, in the life and work of Christ. But it is in the present, in the work of the church and the efforts of many others to create a world of justice and truth, beauty, goodness, and peace. And it is in the future, reaching its completion in the age yet to come, when Christ shall return to present a new kingdom to his Father, restored in love and justice. So, this is what the kingdom of heaven is. At one point, when John the Baptist was in prison and he heard about Jesus uh, picking up his, his message of the kingdom of God is at hand, change your lives and believe the good news, because that was John's message and it also was Christ's message. And then John asked an unusual question of his followers who he says, go to Christ and ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another? And this is what Jesus said with regard to, was he the person that John had preached about? And was this the time of fulfillment at hand? And he says, when John heard in prison of the works, this is from Matthew chapter 11, verse one. When John heard in prison of the works of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to Christ with this question, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? And Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. So instead of Jesus trying to go into any theological dissertation about his unity, you know, with the Father and the Spirit or why he came, he says, look what's happening. This is the kind of thing that happens in the kingdom of God. I imagine that John the Baptist, before he had his head cut off, probably felt that you know, he, could, he could die satisfied and at peace. This Thursday is Thanksgiving. Wow. I love Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is great. <clears throat> At one mass I said, <clears throat> one of the things I like about it is it's not commercial unlike Christmas or Easter, but then someone said, wait a minute, what about Black Friday? What about all the sales? I said, oh, okay, all right, but, you know, that's not what Thanksgiving is about. And what's been happening is in, in this time as we get close to Thanksgiving, people are going, happy Thanksgiving, have a good Thanksgiving, hope your travels go well, are you going to go home, are you bringing something to eat? And, you know, and I'm thinking about, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. I need to stop in the middle of all my busyness and say, what are the things that I'm grateful for? And that's a different feeling than when someone says, you know, um, are you getting ready for Christmas? And I sort, of, I sort of shudder and go, oh God, I wish it wouldn't come so soon. You know, the, uh, when I was a youngster, I used to look at the days that we counted off in the calendar on the paper and saying, so many shopping days till Christmas. And I never thought about shopping days because I didn't do any shopping. I just thought about the gifts that were gonna be coming. So many days to wait till you get presents. And one time I said, apropos of nothing, my father was sitting in the living room. I said, Christmas will never get here. And I heard a voice say, I hope it never gets here. 
So, come to church on Thanksgiving. Cost you nothing to give thanks. Don't have to bring anything. Bring some bread for your table if you want. We'll bless it and you can take it home. But there are so many times in life where we're caught up in the snare of the worldliness and the busyness of life as it is that we forget about the kingdom of God, which is life as it's supposed to be. And so one of the things that would inform us as to how to live a life that is supposed to be is if we take stock to think about how much God has blessed us. Now you might have all sorts of things falling apart in your family. I can't imagine anybody who doesn't have something going on. But there also are many blessings which we can tend to take for granted. Just being able to come here, for instance. I don't mean particularly just here and now at this particular mass, but to be able to pray, profess, share, seek, even just to come together and sit quietly and for a time to magnify our sense of who we are, why we're here, what we're for. It's got to be something that we all need to do very more often than we regularly do. As I get older and the traffic gets <clears throat> busier, I remember a time when we used to play in the street because not everybody had a car. And if you did have a car, you had one car. And if somebody was using it to go to work, the car was not on the street. We didn't even have any driveways back then. Didn't need it, there was nothing else. We played in the street. Now, everyone is caught up in the coming and going of back and forth business and stuff. There is no longer a rush hour or non-rush hour. It's all gridlock. And one of the things I find myself wanting to give thanks for on a regular basis is getting home safely. I feel like I want to kiss the ground when I get out of the car. You know, so everybody has something to be thankful for. Come to church on Thanksgiving Mass at 10 a.m. And I guarantee you, you'll be glad you took the time. And we have a great parish. That doesn't happen without people. So it's good for us to give thanks for one another on that particular day. Then you can go out and buy a car or a mattress or whatever it is that you want to do. <laughs> <laughs>